Uh, good morning and welcome to the White House. Uh, for how many of you, um, is this your first time to the White House? Raise your hand. All right, so about half the room, right? I'm actually more than half of the room. Uh, one of the things that's extraordinary about coming to this place um, is that there is enormous amounts of history as you walk these halls, right? From negotiating peace accords to thinking about the Civil Rights Act uh, to thinking about all the different people who have walked these halls. Um, and you are part of that history today. Um, your names are part of the, the public record. Um, and as you walk uh, through the gates um, th uh, in the afternoon, take a moment to pause and look around you. Look at the fossils in the marble and the floor. Look at the banisters that were carved, thousands of them. Look at the details of the keyholes and the way in which the rooms are structured. Know this building has been renovated many, many times over the arc of its history. You are part of that history and you are helping make that history. So on behalf of the administration, welcome to the White House. We are thrilled to have you here today. My name is Rafael Lopez and I'm the Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth and Families at the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and we are thrilled to have you here from all over the country. Um, for those of you joining us virtually, welcome. We are thrilled that you are joining us. We encourage all of you in virtual land, as well as those of you here in the audience, to use the hashtag libraries for all and to, um, to spread the word about the extraordinary efforts of the partnership that exists and is represented here in the room and across the country between libraries, librarians, county executives and county leaders, mayors and city leaders, um, philanthropy and nonprofits and the tech industry who's coming together to sort of lift up the power of making sure that every child in America is connected in a very powerful way. Yesterday, the country paused as we honored a great American leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, we celebrated his birthday and we celebrated the legacy of not just what he did, but the millions of people he inspired, not just in America, but around the world. And last night at bedtime with my two little boys, we read the I Have a Dream book, and then we listened to the live recording of his speech, um, of the I Have a Dream speech on August 28, 1963, that he delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And after that, we Googled images of what it looked like for him to stand in front of the Lincoln Memorial and to project his dream, not just across the National Mall, but across the world. And in that moment of time, though we've taken my boys to the Lincoln Memorial and to the MLK Memorial many, many times, at the end of the night, right before we turn the lights off, they said, I wanna go to that spot tomorrow night so we can stand just where Dr. King stood. And imagine if for a moment that every child in America could read a book, Google the images, connect, listen to the speech, imagine for a moment what would be possible. What if every child in America could read by grade level? What if every child in America had access to technology? What if every child in America could see and could use the extraordinary resources of libraries? I don't know about you, but in my life, librarians transformed my own life. And it was Miss Sue Foley at a Mesty Elementary School in my rural town of Watsonville, California, that opened up a world that I could only have imagined. I had never traveled before, and she opened up that world to me. Her fancy writing on the walls called calligraphy. After school, she bought a little kit, and she taught me how to write in calligraphy. It was that librarian, Miss Sue Foley, who taught me to read my way through the world, read my way through that library, and to imagine a life I could have never imagined. And that is exactly what all of you are doing today. When we paused yesterday to honor the work and the life of Martin Luther King, we paused because we believed that in his dream, a dream where he challenged us to bend the arc of, moral, of the moral universe toward justice. And that is what you are doing here today at the White House. Your work to connect technology and libraries and city and county leaders, your willingness to step up and to step out and to challenge existing notions of access is powerful. That is what you are doing here today and it is what you're going to do throughout the day. Last year on April 30th, President Obama announced the Connected Library Challenge. Communities throughout the nation stepped up to make sure that they could put a library card into every student's hand. President Obama recognized the critical role that libraries play as trusted community anchors that support learning and connectivity. Like many modern challenges, improving education for all children requires key leaders just like yourselves assembled in this room and watching us and connecting with us throughout the country virtually um, are doing to collaborate in new and powerful ways to bridge the digital divide 
between schools and homes and provide educational services to every person in this country. Under the Connected Library Challenge, library directors committed to work with their mayors, with their county executives, with school leaders, with school librarians and others to create or strengthen partnerships so that every child enrolled in school can receive a library card. These libraries also committed to supporting students learning through programming that develops their language, reading, and critical thinking skills, providing digital resources such as ebooks and online collections of traditional media, and providing broadband connectivity and wireless access within library facilities. The libraries of today are community hubs. They are a place where young people can go to and feel safe and connected and feel supported supported in dreaming and to imagine a new world that they might not otherwise have been able to imagine. To support the implementation of the Connected Library Challenge, the White House and the Institute of Museum and Library Services announced that they would convene communities around the country that have taken up the challenge to identify and share best practices in reaching universal library um, use among public school students. You all did that. And you will continue to do that today by being here in Washington, D.C. and scaling the work that you've already begun to reach even greater numbers of children across the country. And none of this is possible with each of you stepping up and stepping forward to take risks with each other and within your communities. This also could not happen without the leadership of key people here gathered today that we want to take a moment to thank. We want to thank the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, Dr. Catherine Matthew, and her extensive team who helped imagine this convening and helped put into practice and to bring to life the president's vision of connecting us across the country via libraries. We also want to thank the Urban Library Council, including its president and CEO, Susan Benton, who also joins us today, for all of their work in supporting the challenge and bringing the communities here today that are represented in this room. We also want to check, uh, thank the American Library Association, represented by its president, um, Sari Feldman. We are thankful to all of those organizations and the teams represented here today. We also want to take a moment to extend a special welcome to our acting Librarian of Congress, David Mao, um, who's joined here today by Robert Newland, his Chief of Staff. Um, if anyone knows about the grandeur of libraries in Washington, D.C., it certainly is our, li our acting Librarian of Congress. And imagine for a moment if more of our kids across the country could step into that room, either physically or virtually, to experience the grandeur of not only the buildings, but it being connected to so many um, pieces of our history. We also want to take a moment to thank our core planning team, White House colleagues Nancy Weiss, Colin uh, Register, Catherine Galagli, Bridget Cummings, and Seth Andrew all stepped up in immeasurable ways to make sure we're all connected and here today in the room. We also want to thank the um, Institute for Museum and Library Services team, specifically Maura Marks, Sarah Fuller, Michelle Gallinger, and the uh, Urban Library Council team, uh, Chris Becker and Emily Samoz. Many, many others um, have helped in many ways. And if you think about it, the interns who help make sure this all comes together, the staff across this building who will seamlessly move you from place to place and make sure everything is set up for you. We thank them all. And we are so thrilled to have you all here today. With that, I will turn it over to um, the United States Chief Technology Officer, Megan Smith. Thanks, Raphael. It's so awesome to see all of you today. It was really fun to go around and see the breadth of who's here. Um, I always say it takes a network. And uh, it takes a network to do things. And that's been always true. I was lucky to be actually in Philadelphia yesterday uh, with my boys at uh, Independence Hall and Liberty Bell. And it was an amazing day. And the day before, we actually had Seneca Falls. And so just reflecting, like Dr. King, you know, the Americans and, and others who have gone before and uh, built what is our great country, um, and how these shared spaces are so important. I mean, think about Philadelphia and Franklin and the teams and the thoughts about community, not only about the content of, of course, our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all of those pieces there, but really, you know, the, the post office innovations, the firefighters, the libraries, you know, these common spaces where we can come together and share resources and be the community that we can be. And so, um, connected, you know, in, in technology and computer science, certainly we talk about these layers. And really, connected has many layers. One, of course, is the connectivity itself, right? And so, how we're working and the amazing work on e raid and, and FCC teammates and other colleagues all over building the connectivity in our classrooms, 
and in our libraries and our third spaces so that we can be physically, digitally, sort of broadband connected and make that happen and get rid of these connectivity deserts that are really debilitating for those who don't, don't have access and unfair and sort of change that. And then there's this next layer, which is to me sort of the library challenge, which is the, that access card. You know, it's the centennial of the national parks. So every child in a park, right? Every child in a library. So that is an amazing vision. And uh, not just this card, but how are we measuring uh, them? You know, this, this measuring them to come and making sure they're coming on a regular basis and participating. And I have to shout out to Mrs. Irving and the Crane Library in Buffalo, which happened to be luckily on our way home from school. So we would always stop in. And whether it was the quiet times, you know, if you guys each reflect your own experiences in the library, the quiet times of with some books or quietly reading or with friends and making too much noise, getting in a little bit of trouble, which is good. And, uh, or the upstairs or downstairs spaces that are where you get to watch movies or participate or physically do stuff, which are now turning into those amazing maker spaces, you know, and 3D printing and design thinking and community interaction and community mobilization, uh, all of those places that are happening. So that layer of, of the content and then the layer of all of us interconnected with these node places, which are our community community spaces. So really important um, work that everybody's doing through this kind of connect ed, connect community uh, programs. One of the things I always think about and, and in our team, we're always thinking about who are the innovators we can see? How do you find you know, and scout for these extraordinary teams that already have the answer and are already living in the future? Uh, today, uh, this week, the Davos community, uh, sort of the world community, World Economic Forum is meeting, and they're talking about this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. I sort of, I don't know, industrial, maybe, I like to think of the age of creativity, uh, which we've really entered into, and this idea of an interconnected world. And so world leaders are talking about this um, and the impact on our economy and the impact on our people all over the planet and the opportunity that we have to really connect each other and also the downside of that, which is if we don't bother, the divisions we will create and, and the people that we won't include and the solutions that we won't have because those solution makers weren't, didn't get access because everybody has talent, so we need everybody to bring it. Um, some of the Denver team is here. We came across them. Uh, they're doing this incredible work with Code Jojos and uh, sort of dev boot camps and sort of getting kind of what the president's tech hire like programs are about, which is in months, not years, getting people into coding and computer science. We have half a million jobs open in the United States right now. Uh, and we need to get people into the companies that are starving. So these are ecosystem networks where the employers are looking at alternative resumes in addition to that four year and two year degree one, as many as we can get, but we don't have enough. So how do we use these short courses? And what's so great with the Denver team is the work to bridge the library as a place where people can come and find out this exists, find out this opportunity for this, these creative, fun jobs that many people imagine are sort of Mount Everest and distant, but are right there for them, pay a lot of money, and are all about the future, and we need their talent in. We were just at the Cons Consumer Electronics Show, and uh, one of the great things we had, uh, what we did was we brought uh, topics that would be interesting to that community. Uh, we had five different topics and guests on stage. We had uh, the CEO of Autodesk with the whole makerspace out there with us, Albert Brown, who started Telegraph Academy in Oakland, so one of the tech hard communities. We had people talking about inclusive technology. We had people talking about um, the CTO of, uh, of the VA, Marina Martin, was talking about this tour of duty that the president's working on, bringing techies like us out of Silicon Valley, Boston, Austin, to rotate in government just like our our uh, law colleagues, economic colleagues, Surgeon General, other people like that, let's have the digital folks rotating in government. But one of our guests uh, was about smart cities. And this was the CTO of Seattle. One of the things he was sharing was the data science that's happening in the libraries. And so the librarians, who are some of our most extraordinary resources, uh, you can go into the library in Seattle and they'll start working on data science with you and really help people get access to tools about the community itself and doing hackathons. They did uh, hack, the tri hack the Commute um, and hackathons for some of the poorer neighborhoods, people coming together in the same cross-functional way you guys are doing today to network with each other and then get into the data and the data science. Data science is what Davos is talking about. 
data science is what the librarians in Seattle are doing with people there. So the library has a resource in that way, which is incredibly exciting. So really encourage people to share with each other the innovations. You have the people in this room and those on live stream already have many of the solutions working locally that we need. Uh, and so I really encourage you to cross share those, share those on the hashtag uh, libraries for all and so that we can get this done. So I'm gonna end there other than uh, just sharing that um, every person has so much to bring. And the more that we can get the kind of work that we're doing done on behalf of every child and every child at heart, uh, the more we will solve the problems in our communities. The Sustainable Development Goals were ratified by the UN this past, uh, this past uh, September. And we did a solution summit where we just posted a web page up and we asked the world, uh, the UN did this, asked the world, anybody got solutions in progress for these 17 goals that we're setting for the next 15 years for the world? And over 800 proposals of work in progress that people were already doing around ocean health and justice and equality and gender equality and uh, work, uh, smart cities, et cetera, came from over 100 countries. And so again, I encourage you to, to look around at each other because we are the ones we have been waiting for and network together. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> for those of us that are just joining us now via live streams, uh, welcome to the White House and welcome to the Connected Library Challenge Answering the Call. We have folks here in the room today that are from all over the country, from Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, to Kansas City, Missouri, Los Angeles, California, and every point in between. Uh, we thank you all for joining us, and we encourage you to use the hashtag libraries for all to share the good work. Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, David Edelman, Special Assistant to the President for Economic and Technology Policy. Good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, my name is David Edelman. I'm on the National Economic Council, and because I'm on the Economic Council, we like numbers. So let me begin with a number. 2 12 1647 Two nineteen seventy two oh twelve oh nine sixteen forty seven. That number I will never forget as long as I live. That number is my Hennepin County Library card number. <laughs> that number was incredibly important to my childhood. That was the number I needed to take out a novel. That was the number I needed to take out a computer programming book because my middle school didn't have any and I was interested in computers. That was the number I needed to take out books to prove whether or not UFOs were indeed flying over Minneapolis. Turns out they weren't. But I needed a book to figure that out. And although it was counterintuitive in the 1980s, that's where I fell in love with computers, was at the Hennepin County Library, because they were there. That experience to me in a pre-web era, having access to that kind of technology and that kind of information was deeply formative here as we developed the Connect Ed initiative. Many of you know about Connect Ed. Um, I, I won't give you the whole chapter and verse, but let me just say this. When we began looking at Connect Ed, most of the studies that have been done, most of the experience focused exclusively on schools. And the school picture was rough. One in three American schools, only one in three, had what we considered to be the baseline connectivity necessary to do next generation personalized teaching and learning. And the picture was just as bad for libraries. Libraries were hurting. This was at a time when there was zero what we call category two, funding from E-rate going to libraries. If you were a library that wanted to apply for E-rate funding for something as basic as Wi-Fi, the money was not there. And so when we conceived of Connect Ed, and Connect Ed is the president's program to transform teaching and learning wherever it is with technology for all of America's kids, we knew that it was going to be transforming not just schools, but schools and libraries and the communities around them. To de-jargonize this, let me put it this way. Connect Ed has basically one vision. In a country where we expect free Wi-Fi with our coffee, we should demand it in our schools and we have to insist upon it in every one of our libraries. That's the bottom line. In the 30 months since we announced Connect Ed, we've made huge progress. And that's why the president said when he was in Alaska that this is one of the programs that he is most proud of in his then six years in office. 
Let me talk about the various pieces that Megan referred to before. First, connectivity. The President built this atop a bold goal of ensuring that 99 percent of our students were connected to high-speed broadband and wireless in their classrooms and libraries. Since we did that, we have made huge progress and we're well on our way to meeting that 99 percent five-year goal. 20 million more students today have access to that fast connectivity than did when we started 30 months ago. We have, with the help of the FCC and our partners there, put together $8 billion of new funding, $8 billion with a B, that will go to connectivity in libraries and schools that would not have otherwise have been there to make this five-year transformation. But that's only part of it. And while we're incredibly proud of having closed the connectivity divide in schools by half in just the last two and a half years, we know there's a whole lot more to do. None of this would be possible without community. That's the second pillar of ConnectEd. And with the help of great partners at the education department and the nonprofit sector, we've been able to build a network of over 2,000 school districts and the communities around them that have committed to put together the ConnectEd vision in their schools. That includes their school libraries. Third, surging technology into schools to make sure that this vision is available and accessible even to the poorest schools in the country. And with help from the private sector, we've delivered $2 billion of available technology in the form of devices, software, teacher training, and others that are available to educators, not just in schools, but in libraries as well, all over the country. These are incredible private sector opportunities. You can find out more about them at whitehouse.gov slash connected, because many of them are still available and open for sign up. Fourth, we've revitalized training for educators everywhere that it can be. And fifth, we're making a wealth of content available that otherwise wouldn't be. Over a quarter billion dollars of content in the form of free ebooks coming soon, thanks to many of the leaders here today. So I want to preview that and thank those of you who've been working on that incredibly important project. So that's how the pieces of ConnectEd fit together. Not just connectivity for connectivity's sake, but giving kids and their families the opportunity that comes with improved access to information, which in fact actually sounds a lot like the mission of many of you who are here today, including, as I recall, the Hennepin County Library. So with that, the ConnectEd vision, it's now possible and it's very much within reach. And it's only in reach, though, with the sorts of partnerships that are on display today that you're going to hear about in our panels and that we're excited to talk about are taking shape all over the country, not just in Washington, not just in the big cities, but all over the country, between cities, between schools, between libraries, between parents, between nonprofits all over this country. That's the key to realizing this ConnectEd vision. We're going to be leaning on all of your leadership a lot in the coming year uh, to institutionalize this progress that we have made to sustain it, and just as importantly, to get the word out, to share with the rest of the country that this vision is possible, that empowering every American, regardless of income level, with this sort of information is possible, and to show where it's working, to make it easier for those that haven't begun the journey yet. So it is fitting that you're all here today celebrating what is a huge milestone, which is the doubling of the ConnectEd Library Challenge, and there's already been some tremendous progress there. We have a great list of speakers and panels here today, uh, not least of which because, as you can tell, the Minnesota representation is just huge. I mean, way to go, Minnesota. Seriously, that is really great. So we've got great representation here today. And let me just thank all of you, Minnesotans and non-Minnesotans. Really, it's an inclusive bunch. There's a, ev everyone here. I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here. I know a lot of you traveled a long way. I want to thank you for your work getting us to this point and for helping to deliver knowledge and opportunity to every kid in every school and every library, whether she's learning to code or whether he is disproving the existence of extraterrestrials all around us every day. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you, David. <clears throat> and I have no idea that you're from Hennepin County. <laughs> but you know, there you go, right? And, and whether you're from Hennepin County, right, or from Buffalo, as Megan mentioned, or from Watsonville, California, what you are seeing is the impact of libraries and librarians in our lives that open up doors and help us to dream and to imagine new worlds. And with that said, one of the key building blocks of this work and this connected initiative is libraries themselves um, as, as community hubs and centers. So please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Catherine Matthew, the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Good morning. Everyone warming up, I hope? 
Um, thank you for having me. I'd first like to again acknowledge the many public librarians, superintendents, and elected leaders who came here today. I really thank you for accepting this challenge and your commitment to making sure that our nation's children have access to important resources and achieve ac academic success. Of course, thank you to the President for his foresight in launching the Connect Ed initiative, and particularly this library challenge portion, which aims to put a library card in every child's hand. A very also important thank you for lunch. I want to thank our lunch sponsor, Cengage, Brian Reese. I don't know where you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you for lunch. Appreciate it. Um, and standing here and listening to all of this and, and looking at how many of you are here and how many supporters we have of libraries from all over the country, I'm thinking about in 1964 what President Johnson said. Good public libraries must be placed within the reach of all our people. Libraries are just not only for the young and curious about an exciting world. They are not just for busy people looking for information to do their jobs. Libraries are for everyone, and therein lies their value. And we need to keep pushing that access and reach through every community, every school, and every library. I think of Connect Ed as a comprehensive initiative who aims, whose aim is to give students greater connectivity through three pieces, hardware, software, and digital content. In a sense, a perfectly formed triangle where each side reinforces the other. And by giving students greater access to their local libraries, we are also giving them access to the three sides of that triangle. So the co collaboration we're doing today is an essential and tremendous leap in the efforts for quality education for all students. And just a few examples of the progress we're already seeing in communities across the country. Working together, the Tucson Unified School District and the Pima County Public Library in Arizona have formed an incredible partnership. They, the library now trains more than 200 staff members and there are now library advocates within each school site who are promoting the use of library technology resources. Obvious but amazing that they are actually doing that. It's going to have a ripple effect. In Hartford, Connecticut, the Boundless Initiative between the Hartford Public Library and Hartford Public Schools ensures that all public school children have their own library card. The library and schools also plan to work together on programming and purchasing decisions to expand their ebook collection, traditional texts, and online learning resources. So in closing, the President has spoken eloquently in the past about the haves and have nots. And the library challenge is one essential piece of closing that gap. It's one critical part of that puzzle to make sure the puzzle is complete. I'm very proud of the work that has been done to date and that all of you are going to do today. I'm looking forward to your report outs. Really, the work is going to be up to you all in the future to carry this forward. And I thank you again, each and every one of you, for coming today. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. And once again, for those of us joining us via live stream, uh, welcome um, to the White House virtually, and thank you for joining us. We encourage you all to use the hashtag libraries for all um, to share what's going on here throughout the day. And now um, we would like to um, take this a step further in sort of defining the problem, sort of to contextualize not only the work that you've already done uh, with the Connected Challenge by taking it the challenge, but sort of bringing it to life and scaling it in a different way and understanding uh, very concretely the impact um, that this can have in the lives of children. So please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Mr. Ralph Smith, the Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading with the Annie Casey Foundation. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm grateful to Raphael for managing the, the thank yous, because the fact that we're here has a whole lot to do with the collective action 
of uh, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the American Library Association, the Urban Libraries Council, and a host of others. But I would be remiss were I not to take a moment to acknowledge that my being here has a whole lot to do with Susan Benton, uh, who is CEO of the Urban Libraries Council, and who has, as part of a dynamic duo of Susans, uh, made me a strong contender to be the favorite nephew of my favorite aunt, who is a librarian. And she takes great pleasure in the fact that I'm now hanging out with librarians. Because she spent years when I was in uh, elementary and uh, middle school trying to persuade me that the library wasn't really an ATM. You know, that where you go in, you grab the books, and you leave as quickly as possible. Uh, that was the way I looked at it. And she, w she just gave up after a while. And so the fact that I'm hanging out with Susan's and librarians all across the country, she thinks is really, really good. You know, uh, this being here today for me is quite special for a number of reasons, not only uh, because of uh, learning a lot more about libraries, but because having spent uh, the last five years on the campaign for grade level reading, I'm closer to understanding a question that I asked when I made the transition to policy. You know, I, con I confess it rarely, but I started life as a tax and corporate and securities lawyer and law teacher, and then went on uh, and made the switch. And when I made the switch, I grew to understand and respect the people who made a living doing their life's work. And yet there was this question, you know, how could we know as much as we do, spend as much as we do, care as much as we say we do, and accomplish so little for so many children over so long a period of time as permanently to compromise their ability to grow up, to be responsible adults, productive participants in the economy, uh, effective parents. And the answer I came to was that we don't know as much as we think we do and often lack the personal courage and political will to act on what we do know. We don't spend as much as we may need to, but until we do better with what we have, it's going to be difficult to make the case for what we need. And we don't care as much as we do because some children matter more than others and some children matter not at all. And it is about those children and on behalf of those children that I've tried to invest time, attention, and energy over the last two decades. And I've got to tell you that over the past five years, I've come to see a phenomenon that is, for many of us, an inconvenient truth. A truth that's so inconvenient that in some quarters it's heresy. We have a significant and growing number of children who are falling beyond the reach of schools. Children falling beyond the reach of schools. For those of us who have spent a whole lot of time uh, on schools and in education, that is really disturbing. But it is more than disturbing because when we say we have kids who are falling beyond the reach of schools, it gives lie to this notion to which we all subscribe and which we repeat, that education is the pathway out of poverty, that education is the portal and the doorway to opportunity. 
that it is education which keeps the American promise that where you end up won't depend on where you begin. For those children who have fallen beyond the reach of school, all that becomes meaningless. And if it becomes meaningless to them, it becomes a threat to the rest of us. Who are these kids? They're mostly poor, almost all poor, and largely children of color. And we can identify those kids pretty early. These are the kids who show up to school already so far behind that it's highly unlikely that given how we resource schools today that those kids are going to catch up. These are the kids who fall behind during the school year because they miss so many days of school and so much instruction that they can't keep pace. And these are the kids for whom summer is a moment of risk and who return to school in September farther behind than when they left in June. Each of these, starting behind, falling behind, and losing ground over the summer, each of these would be a problem. But in many communities, these three combine into the same kid in the same families. The same kid that starts out behind, falls farther behind, and loses ground over the summer. What we are beginning, what we know, is this is a problem that schools can't manage alone. So let me give you a number, not my library card number, <laughs> but this number, 24, 7, 365, 2G. If we are going to respond to the challenges of these kids, we're going to have to find ways to build the capacity and build the platforms, build seamless systems that can provide care, services, family supports, and appropriate interventions on a 24-7, 365, two-generation basis. And we know that schools can't do that. And that's why we have been at the campaign, we have been working really hard and with a lot of encouragement from many people in this room and many of the communities represented in this room to, to see whether we can help to build a platform which would involve public housing where the kids and families live, public health, the challenges that keep so many of them away from school. Of course, public schools, but also public libraries and museums. Public libraries and museums are those unique American third places, the places, go, the places people go, not because they have to, but because they want to. They are the trusted institutions and community anchors. So they've got to be in the mix, and that is why this initiative is so, so important that we are finding ways, and you are leading the way, to bring institutions together so that we can stop the finger pointing, stop the blaming, and really begin to work on behalf of these kids. Imagine a superintendent that can say, rather than being defensive, I need you to send me more kids that are ready, and last year you didn't. I need you to make sure that kids show up to school 95% of the time, and you haven't done that for the last five years. And I need you to take care of those kids over the summer so they come back at least where we left them in June. And then imagine the community saying to the superintendent, well, then you've got to figure out how to get us the data. 
you've got to find inno innovative ways to tell us before the school year ends which children in which neighborhoods are struggling readers so that we can take care of them over the summer. Imagine that conversation. That's what you're, cre you're creating the platform for a very different conversation, a very different body of work, and arguably a more effective address to the challenge and a way to produce good outcomes. And finally, let me say what this initiative has done is recognize that these are not problems that are going to be settled globally. These are problems that are going to be settled locally. The solutions are going to be have, have to be found, designed, adapted locally. And that won't happen without leadership. From the Vatican, Pope Francis, on down and all around the world. In fact, next year there's going to be a parliament of mayors. What there's a growing recognition that the future democracy depends a great deal on the local leadership, leadership within localities, to pull people together to help them to seek and find the best. And what this initiative has done is taken public schools, paired them with those third place institutions, public libraries, put superintendents in the room along with mayors and asked the mayors and the county executives to provide the leadership and the glue, the glue that will make, will put local solutions within reach. You now represent the best hope for those kids who are falling beyond the reach of schools. You represent the nucleus of that new platform. And as you reach out and you embrace public health and public housing, as you push to results, as you try to make sure that there's shared ownership, joint accountability, good data, that we reach the most vulnerable children and we commit, commit to stay in the course for the long run, you will usher in a new day and a new hope and a new possibility that we can keep the promise we ought to make to those kids who have fallen beyond the reach of schools because it's a promise we should make to every kid. Let me say to all of you, here today. Thank you for signing up. Thank you for stepping up, and God bless. Thank you, Ralph, for helping us um, expand our knowledge and our thinking about this work. Uh, for those of you joining us via live stream, welcome. Um, to the White House, and we encourage all of you to use the hashtag libraries for all to share what you're hearing today and the extraordinary work that you're doing across the country and represent here in the room. Uh, now we'd like to invite Marvin Carr, um, a policy advisor for STEM education and diversity from the White House Office in Science and Technology Policy, and Trey Bonaparte, um, a junior at uh, SUNY Binghamton, class of 2017, to join us and to sort of um, frame up the impact of this work, not just in their lives, but the way in which they see this work moving forward. Please join me in a warm, warm, warm round of applause for Marvin and for Trey. Good morning. Good morning. That's so exciting. Good morning. Good morning. There we go, there we go. So how many of y'all were in San Diego a few months ago with me at the Urban Library Guys? Hey, y'all. I miss y'all. Um, so I told, my mom, I told my mother that I'd be coming back to the library, and she said, oh, have fun. I told her about how great the time was. Um, but um, as you said, my name is um, Marvin Carr, and I kind of want to just talk to you about um, the story of My Brother's Keeper, the President's Initiative on ensuring um, access and opportunities for all people, for all young people, but specifically for boys and young men of color. Um, and I kind of want to frame that really quickly about how libraries and third spaces all across the country can really um, have have effect 
and has current effects um, on the lives, particularly on, um, uh, on, on young people in, in urban areas and in, and in suburban and rural areas um, where the opportunity to, su to succeed um, uh, is not um, uh, always available. So one of my favorite quotes is that although um, genius is evenly distributed um, according to zip code, opportunities are not. Right? And so the, role, the whole purpose of this program, of, of my Rose Keeper initiative, is to ensure that genius and opportunities are evenly distributed. Um, just a very, very quick kind of story. My story is Trey's story. The reason I am a 28-year-old, and I'm getting old, um, White House policy advisor from the Projects of Detroit, um, who just got his PhD, is because of a librarian named Mrs. Bumgarner. Um, after work, my mama had to, um, had to my, mama, my mama got off work at like 8 o'clock every night. My brothers were sports guys, right? And so I had nothing to do. I didn't have, I didn't have practice to go to. And so while she was working, uh, I stopped after school at the library that was um, in, our, in our neighborhood, in Detroit Public Library. I did that every day from third grade to ninth grade. Um, and it opened up the door um, that I stepped into where I'm sitting here now, um, here at the White House speaking to you, simply because uh, it's the first place where I learned how to code. It's the first place where I had true access to the outside world. Um, living in the projects, there were no internet. This is the beginning of the internet era where I was growing up. And so truly libraries can have a, 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 a huge impact on the lives of all people, but especially for boys um, and girls of color. And so um, this is just wanted to kind of open it up and say, why are we here today? We're here today to figure out how and why um, should we connect all of our students to s and to science and technology. Um, and it's primarily because of the opportunities that they are not missing out on. Um, so my grandfather always said to me, and I'm going to turn over the tray, we don't have much time, that education, um, Dr. King may have been wrong, and as we celebrate him and all of his, his, his dreams, education is not the great equalizer, right? Um, and as I see now, education in the, abs in the absence of opportunities is just book work and test taking. Right? And so I, I know plenty of, of, of women with PhDs in engineering who can't find jobs, because right? no one's giving them the opportunity to express and to use their skills. And so the person my brother is keeping is sure that all young people, all people, um, have e equal ex access and to understand the difference between equality and equity. And I think libraries and third spaces can be that equitable bridge um, to ensure that not only genius but opportunities are even distributed um, across zip codes. So now I want to introduce Trey Bonaparte. Uh, he's a 20-year-old um, junior yes. at uh, SUNY Binghamton, um, whose similar story came from the New York Public Libraries. And so I kind of want to show you, you know, what's currently happening, what, what, how, how that has affected his life, and how you can partner with, um, can, can collaborate with, uh, with organizations and, and, and teams like the My Brother's Keeper and the Councilwoman and Girls to ensure that these opportunities are evenly distributed. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm truly excited and honored to be here in the White House to speak with you all about my experience in the library. Um, I just want to share a little bit of my, about my story and how the library has impacted me in my life and how I got here today. I was 12 when my reading teacher took out class to the New York Public Library. My glossy new library card let me take home books like the Lightning Thief series, which turned out to be the first big series I fell in love with. The pages felt grainy, smooth, and left a faint scent of forest on my fingertips. And as, I, and as I turned page after page, I lost myself within the confines of the author's imagination. What felt like a moment turned into hours and then into days of escaping from my reality and experiencing what it might be like to dream big. My parents had moved from Trinidad to Harlem a few years before I was born with the hopes that they would be able to benefit from the opportunities that New York City had to offer. Because they were not able to attend college themselves, they made sure that I'd be the first person in the family to do so. We were poor, so we didn't have many books at all, except for the occasional outdated encyclopedia. My parents didn't have the time or money to shed light on the book's potential to open up educational paths, and my, pu and my public library filled those shoes when I was young. And if while young, the Lightning Thief series taught me how to read, then when I was older, books like The Invisible Man, the Alchemist in 1984 taught me how to live. Existentialism, transcendentalism, objectivism, even those words let me think more abstractly. Libraries gave me a space to find books, and books themselves gave me a space to find myself. And now I find myself in college at Binghamton University, 
where the library is taking on new meaning for me because it leads to a future I'm so close to touching in reality, as opposed to a future that I can only touch in my dreams. The library provides a vast and peaceful space for scholars like myself to conduct research, build connections, and ultimately graduate to new ideas. By going to the library in order to pull all-nighters, analyze texts, and write countless essays, I now realize that each novel, essay, and journal I read brings me closer to becoming a first-generation college graduate while making my dreams become a reality. Thank you. <laughs>